Thank you for joining the LLSC today. We'll be starting the webcast in two minutes. For those of you who just connected, we'll get started in about one more minute. Welcome to the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society of Canada's webcast, Allogenic Stem Cell Transplant from Referral to Follow-up. We're so pleased to have you here. In this webcast, transplant coordinators Lucas Chambers and Jason Raymer at the Cross Cancer Institute in Edmonton will provide insight into the pathway prior to allogenic stem cell transplant and the road to recovery afterwards. Next slide, please. This webcast is the second of three sessions offered today in the Western Canada Blood Cancer Conference. Our third session will include a panel of speakers who will share their diagnosis, treatment, and recovery, as well as provide personal insight into managing a blood cancer diagnosis. If you haven't registered for this session but would like to, it's not too late. You can email Desiree Naylor at D-E-S-I-R-E-E dot N-A-Y-L-O-R at L-L-S dot org for the registration link. We'd be happy to help you out. Let me introduce myself. My name is Caroline Mitchell, and I'm the Senior Community Services Manager for the BC Region at the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society of Canada. I'm pleased to be the host of this live event. The presentation today will last about 60 minutes and will include a question and answer period at the end. Since there are many of you on the call today, we invite you to type your answers and comments in the Q&A box of your Zoom webinar panel throughout the presentation. An LLSC staff member will monitor the questions. At the end, I will read your questions aloud during the question and answer period. The conference is also being recorded. Therefore, you can listen to it again on our website. Before we begin our main presentation, I'd like to share with you our mission and highlight some resources that may be helpful for you or someone you know. At the LLSC, our mission is to, to cure blood cancers and improve the quality of life of those touched by a blood cancer and their families. We offer guidance and support every step of the way. Next slide, please. We know the current situation presents many challenges to those affected by a blood cancer and their families. The Leukemia and Lymphoma Society's Community Services Managers can help. As compassionate connectors, we're here to help those affected by a blood cancer with anxiety and isolation during these times. Please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Next slide, please. 
We offer a variety of educational resources and support services to help those affected by a blood cancer. For example, on our website, bloodcancers.ca, you can watch the recordings of all our past webcasts and view announcements for upcoming webcasts. Next slide, please. Subscribe and listen to our podcast series, The Blood Cancer Experience, to learn more about treatment and research and to hear stories from people affected by blood cancer. Available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and anywhere you enjoy listening to your favorite podcasts. Next slide, please. Also on our website, you can access free booklets and fact sheets containing information about specific blood cancers, treatments, and practical information. You'll also see our newly added AML educational video. Next slide, please. Our peer support program is a support service that matches people affected by a blood cancer, caregivers and their families to trained volunteers who've been touched firsthand by a blood cancer experience and who also share a similar experience as you, you may be going through. Whenever possible, participants and volunteers are matched based on their diagnosis, age and gender. This can be a useful program during these days to counter the effects of isolation. Next slide, please. It is my pleasure today to welcome our two speakers, Lucas Chambers and Jason Ramers. Uh, thank you for taking time out of your day to be here to support our community. I'll tell you a little bit about each of our guest speakers before we go ahead and get started. Lucas Chambers graduated from the University of Alberta with a Bachelor of Science in Nursing in 2017. And he started his career as a registered nurse at the Cross Cancer Institute in Edmonton in outpatient and inpatient oncology care. In his current role as allergenic bone marrow transplant coordinator, he assists the referral and workup process of prospective transplant recipients and supports patients and families' needs during their journey towards transplant. Our other speaker is Jason Raymer, who is a registered nurse. He's very passionate about caring for individuals with various hematological disorders. He has experience working in both inpatient and outpatient hematology and oncology settings, and currently serves as an allergenic bone marrow transplant coordinator at the Cross Cancer Institute in Edmonton. His role involves walking alongside patients post-transplant and assisting them in managing their follow-up care. Please help me in welcome, uh, welcoming Lucas and Jason today. Thank you so much for being here and we're looking forward to your presentation. All right, well, thank you for the very warm welcome. Um, I can say right off the bat that uh, speaking for Jason and myself that we're very um, honored to be able to speak uh, to all of you today about allogeneic stem cell transplant. It's an area that uh, we are both very passionate about. So without further ado, we will go ahead and get started. So this is just some of the um, objectives we'll be looking at today. Uh, what is an allogeneic stem cell transplant? Who's it for? Uh, what does the pathway to transplant look like? And what's the follow-up care after transplant? So just some disclaimers. Um, this uh, presentation, it's not representing the views of our employer, Alberta Health Services. Um, this information is not meant to replace your healthcare provider. Um, and a referral for allogeneic stem cell transplant uh, should be discussed with your provider. And just know that not all transplant journeys are the same, but... Uh, this is just a general overview of some of the common themes. So starting off, um, what is transplant? So we can define transplant as a stem cell. Um, transplant is a multimodal intensive treatment for aggressive high-risk leukemias and lymphomas and other blood and marrow disorders and diseases. So hem hematopoietic stem cells, which are the stem cells we're looking to um, infused back in uh, to a patient. Uh, they're essentially immature cells that are located in our blood marrow, and they have the ability to differentiate and mature into all of our other important blood cells that our bodies require to function properly. 
So that includes red blood cells that help carry oxygen to our tissues, uh, white blood cells that are a component of our immune system that help fight off infection and illness, and platelets which regulate blood clotting. So the stem cells are infused or transplanted after a high dose uh, chemotherapy, immunotherapy, and or radiation. Um, and this process is called bone marrow ablation. And so the donor stem cells, those are thought to be the rescue after that high dose or intensive treatment. Um, now that the bone marrow would be damaged after that high dose treatment, um, it allows your body to reset its bone marrow with donor cells um, and start producing those blood cells that are important for our function. So there's two types of stem cell transplant. And today, obviously, we're going to be talking about the allogeneic side, um, but there's also a autologous transplant. And so the main difference um, is auto is meaning self and allo meaning other or different. So an autologous transplant, um, that's where we're using your own stem cells. Now for um, deciding which type of transplant um, you would be eligible for, we kind of need to look at the origin of the dysfunction um, or the disease. So because of um, leukemia and other bone marrow disorders, um, we cannot use your own stem cells uh, as a potential treatment option. Um, that's because there's a high chance that we would be retransplanting um, some disease cells, okay? So um, there's not necessarily a better type of transplant. It's more or less looking at the uh, purpose for the transplant and, um, you know, what we're trying to gain out of it and eligibility for each type. So it's always important to discuss with your transplant team um, or your hematology oncology team, which type of transplant you're eligible for and which one you have been referred for. All right, so let's dive into the referral and workup process for allo stem cell transplant. Um, now, like I said earlier, not all workup or transplants are going to be the same for each patient. Um, so it's, it's kind of hard to put a timeline on exactly when from initial diagnosis and referral to the actual infusion of the stem cells, how long that will take. Uh, but generally, we do expect it to take a couple months um, from start to finish. And there's so many variables that can affect that timeline. But starting off with initial diagnosis and referral, um, looking at leukemia, um, we're typically initiating a referral, um, or sorry, uh, diagnostic uh, investigations when patients are symptomatic due to abnormal blood counts. Um, so that can lead to fatigue, infection, bleeding, et cetera. Um, but a key component in obtaining a clear diagnosis is through a bone marrow biopsy and the important tests that we run on these samples. The bone marrow biopsy allows our labs and pathologists to not only look for irregularities in the structures of the cells, um, but also to, to test for genetic irregularities to help guide our treatment. So in Alberta, we're typically referring um, any new diagnosis of acute leukemia uh, for stem cell transplant, allogeneic stem cell transplant. And this is to account for the time that it takes to actually um, work up for transplant and complete a donor search. So it's very valuable time that we, uh, we get patients started on this journey quickly. Now with referral, it doesn't mean that um, you know, you're guaranteed or you're slotted for um, a transplant as we need to determine some eligibility for that. And that's not always a clear cut way of determining this um, eligibility or need for transplant. Um, so with leukemia and some other of the bone um, marrow disorders, diseases, um, we're going to want to determine a risk status. So with that, we are looking at any molecular or cytogenetic um, irregularities. So that's going back to that genetic testing we do on the uh, initial marrow. And so we're looking for any irregularities in your chromosomes and DNA um, that could potentially give us a um, insight on the aggressiveness of uh, the disease and also the risk status of relapse 
with after the induction treatment. So it's always important to discuss um, risk status with your disease and your hematology care team, um, because that's going to ultimately affect whether or not uh, they would think the transplant would be necessary. So moving on to the donor search, that is largely um, where the majority of time gets eaten up in the workup process for a stem cell transplant. Now there's three sources that we are using for stem cell donation. Um, the first two, um, sibling or related donor and the match unrelated donors, those are gonna be the two that I focus on today. Um, there is potential for cord blood donations. Um, however, they're not heavily used, um, uh, and that's due to several things. Uh, there's usually a bit of variability in the amount of stem cells in each cord blood unit. Um, and also those stem cells are quite immature, and that can cause some delayed immune recovery and engraftment issues. Um, a final thing is that once we use a cord blood sample, uh, we aren't able to go back to that source if we are needing um, to collect more stem cells for a potential second transplant for a patient or a booster. Now, looking into the donor search more, um, the selection process that we use right off the bat is HLA typing, and I'll be talking about that in the next slide here. So HLA typing, HLA standing for human leukocyte antigen, and it's a component of your immune system. Um, they're proteins that are found on cells in the body, which helps the immune system recognize cells that are yours, meaning that they have the same HLA typing, and those that do not belong in your body with a differing HLA typing. So it's usually done through blood work, but we are also able to test for the HLA typing with buccal or cheek swabs. Now, because this is a DNA test, um, it does take around three weeks usually um, to process, and that's on the quicker end of things. Um, and this is uh, the process for both recipients and potential donors that we'd be um, trying to match with the HLA typing. So that's why getting that referral process started as soon as possible or as early as possible is great because it will account for um, some of those some of that time that it takes to get that HLA typing back. Now, the purpose of the HLA typing um, is to reduce the risk of rejection of the stem cells, like I mentioned, um, and ensuring that these cells are able to make their new home in your bone marrow. Um, we're also trying to get a closest match, closest match as possible, as that will also help reduce the risk of um, severe graft-versus-host disease, which will be covered later in this um, presentation. Now, the typing process can be very uh, complex and not an easy process at all. Um, we're trying to match several uh, criteria with HLA um, with the donor and uh, the potential, um, the patient, sorry. Um, and some of the criteria can be mismatched. Um, so you might see that uh, you know, a donor might be matched fully uh, with 10 out of 10 or eight of eight. And that's just accounting for the different um, criteria that have been matched for that case. Um, now it is possible to have a mismatched donor, um, but with that comes uh, some potential higher risks for um, adverse events or side effects. And that should be discussed with your transplant team. So talking a bit more about related donors and unrelated donors, um, we can kind of compare and contrast some of the, the information with them. But our first option that we always try to explore uh, for a potential donor um, are for full siblings. And that's because um, there's a 25% chance that full siblings, meaning same mom and dad, will have the same HLA typing as their sibling. And that's due to the fact that each child gets half of their um, HLA typing um, from the genes of each parent. Um, so that creates a possible of four combinations. Um, now, obviously, if a patient has a whole team of family members, full siblings, that will increase the chance of finding a fully matched sibling donor. 
And the nice thing about sibling donors um, is that they're accessible and they're quite reliable for collection. We're able to see them in person and assess them quite um, fully before um, moving forward with the transplant workup. And in about 30% of cases, um, we'll find a fully matched sibling. So moving on to the unrelated donors, um, this is the most common source of uh, donor cells for transplant. Uh, so about 70% of cases will use um, unrelated donors, or we call them MUDs. And with searching for these donors, um, we're looking at numerous registries across the world for potential donors. And these are all people that have volunteered to have their HLA typing done and um, go on a registry to potentially uh, make a change or save someone's life uh, with stem cell transplant. Now, you might be wondering how it's possible for a complete stranger to uh, potentially have the same HLA typing as you. And that's because uh, what we do know about HLA typing is it does run in racial or ethnic groups. Um, so with that comes the issue of uh, some registries having an un underrepresented population um, in various ethnic backgrounds. So those people unfortunately might have a bit of an issue uh, finding a donor. But uh, the thing also with unrelated donors, uh, we are at the mercy of the registry and the donor to be available to donate and also to keep up with their contact information. Um, some patients, you know, they'll have a wide, uh, you know, be a nice long list of potential donors that are fully matched. Um, but unfortunately, sometimes, you know, the people who have the greatest intention of, of signing up for being a donor, um, they fall off the radar and maybe don't uh, update their contact information, and then we can't use them as potential donors. Some of the other criteria that we are looking for donor search is CMV zero status, um, CMV standing for cytomegalovirus, um, as that can play heavily into any uh, post-transplant um, infection issues. Um, we're also looking at blood typing, so ABO compatibility. Um, donor age and sex, uh, we're wanting young, fit, healthy donors. Um, the younger the patient or the donor, um, usually the healthier the stem cells. And we generally find that we're able to procure a much greater cell count from males. And that's just due to bone structure. So going back to the HLA typing with siblings, um, this is just a great uh, image that shows um, how there's the four combinations um, with fully matched siblings um, and the 25% chance. So you can see with Susan, um, her HLA typing is represented by the green uh, triangles and the yellow circle. We see uh, both her mom and dad have one of those components. And then we can see that one of her brothers luckily is a match, um, the gentleman with the facial hair. So that kind of, uh, just gives you a, an imaging view of how that can work. So moving on to workup for transplant. This will be started once we have a donor situation and your need for transplant clarified. Um, and as well, your decision to proceed with this workup. Um, now, this is going to be a, an extensive list of investigations and testing um, and that's to evaluate your fitness for transplant. So we know stem cell transplant is a very intensive treatment, um, and it's important that we identify any potential problems uh, physically um, that could lead to complications post-transplant or eliminate the eligibility for transplant. So some of these tests include uh, full panel of blood work, so blood counts and general chemistry. Um, that's going to help assess you know, how your blood is functioning, uh, liver, kidney status. Uh, we're also looking at transmissible diseases such as hepatitis, HIV, um, any opportunistic um, immune infections, um, as well as your immune function. 
Uh, we want to look at your heart health. Uh, that could be done with ECG, so an electrocardiogram, and an echocardiogram, which not only looks at the function of your heart, but also the structures of it, uh, just to make sure that everything is good in that sense. Um, lung health, very important. We're looking at imaging, chest x-ray, CT scan, um, as well as pulmonary function tests, which is looking at how the lungs are functioning. A dental exam uh, is very important. Uh, we do know that teeth can be a uh, very common source for infection post-transplant. So we wanna make sure that any issues are taken care of before transplant. And also looking at your eyes. One of the biggest things though is your functional status. And functional status is um, us talking about how independent you are. Um, are you able to take care of yourself? Are you remaining active? Um, that's going to be a key indicator on how well you tolerate the treatment and how well you bounce back after. Okay, so really plays into the recovery portion uh, post-transplant. Moving into transplant, uh, we also want to assess your disease status and see if you are in remission. Um, very important for the leukemics. Uh, we want to do a bone marrow biopsy, aspirate, um, and that's measuring for any residual disease. Um, outcomes are generally thought to be improved when we have a negative um, test for MRD or uh, residual disease. Um, some of the other things we can do for assessing disease status is other imaging. Um, if you have uh, lymphoma, uh, any CNS involvement, which can be through lumbar puncture. Um, but we also really like to stress a holistic approach. So while all of the physical um, criteria matters heavily, um, also, you know, how, how are you doing mentally, psychologically, and as well socially? Um, speaking for the Northern Alberta patients, um, they have to go all the way down to Calgary for several months. Uh, so the social aspects can be um, quite daunting for those patients. So we want to make sure that we're, we're covering all the bases and and making sure people are healthy all around. So once we have all the workup completed um, for the recipient and as well the donor, it is and it is de determined safe to proceed. All parties are agreeable. Um, we have all the information education done. Um, now we have to address the conditioning treatment um, and that's given prior to infusion of the stem cells. So the conditioning treatment is the process of clearing out uh, the bone marrow. Um, I mentioned that earlier with uh, that being the bone marrow ablation. Um, and what that does is make space and um, for those new cells to make their home in your bone marrow. But it's also kind of a last chance to kill off any residual uh, disease cells that we might not have been able to detect. Now, the exact regimen for conditioning therapy does depend on disease and specific patient information. So um, status going in, any comorbidities, um, organ dysfunction um, can tweak the uh, conditioning treatment in any way. So um, not everyone's going to achieve uh, or receive the same uh, conditioning treatment, but just know that any adjustments to it are made for your safety. Now, typically a combination of high dose chemotherapy, total body irradiation and immune suppression is used for the conditioning treatments. Um, but your transplant team will uh, give you that information prior to proceeding and making sure that you receive all the education on the potential side effects and um, risks associated with the conditioning treatment. A big part in um, uh, getting admitted for this is the, um, the reason for it is it's usually given the week before the infusion of the stem cells. Um, and that's because with this high dose treatment, um, this intensive treatment, we do expect there to be side effects. And we just wanna make sure that you are uh, well cared for during that process and that we're providing any supportive uh, treatments or um, anything that you need basically to get through that process. Now you can expect uh, when you do get admitted, uh, you will have insertion of a central line or a CVAD. Um, and that's a very handy device you can see at the bottom right um, that allows us to infuse multiple medications, the stem cells themselves, uh, chemotherapy, uh, blood transfusions. We could take blood from it. It's, 
going to make your life um, a lot easier uh, while you're admitted in the hospital. Less pokes. So we've come to the big day. So stem cell infusion day, we call that day minus zero or day zero, sorry. And that is your infusion day. The subsequent days post uh, infusion of the stem cells, we can call day plus one, day plus two, and so on. Now the infusion of stem cells is generally a very quick process, uh, similar to a blood transfusion. And quite frankly, it's a little bit uh, underwhelming <laughs> with uh, the massive workup that everyone has gone through to get to that point, uh, which is a good thing. We don't need any more excitement, I guess, when we're uh, getting that treatment. So um, usually these cells are um, fresh, infused fresh, and that's typical to the donor collection process that is close to the administration. There are some instances where a stem cell unit may need to be frozen, cryopreserved, um, and all that really is going to change is some of the infusion um, care pieces. So we just need to be a little bit extra careful during those infusions due to the preservative agent used to protect the cells during the pro uh, freezing process. So once we have the stem cells in, um, that starts the post-transplant uh, recovery period. And that leads me to hand over the presentation to my colleague, Jason, who will be talking about post-transplant recovery. So thank you for listening. All right, thanks, Lucas. Um, let me just grab hold of the screen. There we go. Yeah, like was mentioned at the beginning, my name's Jason. Um, I'm a registered nurse who works with uh, patients after they receive a stem cell transplant. Um, that's why I'll be presenting the follow-up care portion um, of this presentation. Uh, on the screen, you can see uh, different categories of different time periods post-transplant. I'll use this as kind of a guide um, or a framework um, to kind of um, guide my presentation and uh, to kind of share the unique needs that come in each um, phase after transplant. It is important to note, uh, like was mentioned at the at the beginning, everybody's transplant journey looks a little bit different. Um, some people may struggle more in area A, or some will struggle more in area B. Um, some will have a more rapid recovery, while some will take a little bit more time to recover. Um, some people, and it really can be at any of these stages, um, they can um, step out of these stages and, and transfer into a more palliative care setting um, where they focus on uh, less on prolonging life and more on um, being comfortable at the end of life. So please, as we go through these slides, don't take it as a uh, predictive measure. Um, just see it as an overview. And uh, it's just to help you become a little bit more familiar of what um, follow-up care might entail after transplant. With that being said, let's look at the first month after transplant. So the first month is usually when the patient is the sickest. Um, they've just received that chemo and radiation and they're starting to feel effects. As well, everybody is eagerly awaiting the new stem cells to uh, take root in the bone marrow and start producing blood cells. Um, that's why patients will need to stay, uh, usually stay in the hospital for the first month after transplant, um, just because they're so sick and so much is going on. Um, they need to be closely monitored by the healthcare team, such as nurses, doctors, pharmacists, um, dietitians, um, to make sure that they, uh, are treated promptly for any complication that does arise. Some of the things that they'll be watching for um, is complications from chemo and radiation, uh, infection, uh, or we'll be watching engraftment, um, and we'll be looking for uh, acute graft versus host disease. Um, I wanna look closer at each of these ones in the upcoming slides. First is the side effects of chemo and radiation. Many patients are probably familiar um, with chemotherapy, having received it first when they're first diagnosed um, and, and receiving that induction chemotherapy. Um, so some of this might be a review, but like uh, Lucas mentioned, the chemotherapy regimes that we give patients are pretty tense. The purpose is to wipe out that um, old bone marrow along with the problem cells um, and, then and then make room for these new um, stem cells uh, to plant themselves and take root. However, when we do this, um, because of the intensity of the chemo, there are some undesirable effects. 
Um, without the bone marrow, patients can't produce their own um, blood cells um, until the stem cells take root. Uh, this can take a couple weeks, um, which leaves patients with low red blood cells, um, which often need to be replaced with transfusions. Um, it leaves their white blood cells um, and the first line of defense neutrophils um, low as well. Um, this can be very dangerous and, and, and be a risk factor for infection. Uh, I'll go into this more in an upcoming slide as well. Um, the platelets are low, which leave patients at risk for bleeding. Um, so we're monitoring carefully, avoiding anything can that can cause trauma and uh, replacing platelets when they become too low. Nausea and vomiting is a common side effect, diarrhea, liver problems, um, such as hepatic sinusoidal obstruction syndrome, um, SOS. That's where your liver can't clear out some of those toxins or waste products. Um, and then it starts building up in the body. Uh, there's uh, mouth sores that happen after chemotherapy, otherwise referred to as mucositis. This can make eating uncomfortable and just, uh, yeah, generally every day uncomfortable. Um, fatigue is very common after transplant as well. Um, the, the most acute phase of it being in that first month, just because of the amount of stress, the physical stress that the uh, transplant places on your body. And of course, uh, aesthetically as well, it can uh, make people lose, uh, lose their hair, which is a common side effect of uh, chemotherapy. This is a daunting list of necessary evils. Um, however, it's important for patients to remember that the healthcare team will be right there alongside them, um, that they're gonna be expecting these things um, and they're gonna be they're doing their best to prevent them and uh, treat them uh, if they do occur. So infection is one of those complications I've mentioned um, during that first month because of the immune system um, is wiped out along with the bone marrow. Uh, it leaves patients at high risk for bacterial, viral, and fungal infections. Um, we try to prevent this by giving medications, having good hygiene, and avoiding anything that could increase the risk of infection. Uh, but sometimes it's still not enough. Uh, sometimes the, the microbes on and in our bodies um, can be enough to cause infection when our barriers are broken down and we are neutropenic. Um, so um, that's why it's really important for patients to work with their healthcare teams closely, monitor for signs of infections, and then uh, treat it promptly um, and take it very seriously. So um, yeah, but after that first month, your neutrophils will start to recover um, to more acceptable levels. What people don't realize usually though is that transplant patients can actually be immunocompromised for at least one to two years post-transplant, um, depending on how quickly their immune system recovers and whether they're able to be weaned off immunosuppression medication. Of course, the further away a patient gets from transplant, the less likely for infection, um, but patients still need to be um, on guard, watching for signs and uh, avoiding high-risk activities. This obviously has effect on lifestyle after transplant um, while their immune system recovers, but I've seen patients uh, make it work and be really creative um, with uh, protecting themselves. I think COVID-19 has really opened people's eyes to uh, a life in um, immunocompromised person's lifestyle, um, even in non-pandemic times. Immunocompromised people wear masks when necessary, socially distant, avoids crowds, avoids sick family members and friends. They do this on a daily basis, whether there is a pandemic or not. So I think it's uh, made people realize a little bit more um, how people who are immunocompromised live. This first month is often referred to as well as the engraftment period. Um, this is because those donor cells, um, which you can think of as a sort of seed, finds its way into the cleared out bone marrow, plants itself and starts producing new blood cells. This process usually takes about two to four weeks and the team will obviously be very, um, or monitoring very closely with daily blood work um, to watch this process unfold. In rare cases, the graft, um, those stem cells are rejected by the, the host um, or they don't work properly. If this were to happen, it would be a very serious complication, um, but the team would discuss with the patient um, available options at that time. However, in most cases, the stem cell plants itself um, in two to four weeks and starts producing those new blood cells. Something that many people have not heard of before, but is an all too familiar concept for patients with um, an allogeneic stem cell transplant is graft versus host disease, 
or you may hear me abbreviate it for to uh, GVHD, uh, just to cut down the name. Um, I like this cartoon by Osmosis because it simplifies, simplifies something very complicated by breaking down the name. It's where a graft, um, which is a section of transplanted or donated tissue, um, turns and attacks the host, who is the person who is receiving the transplant. Because the patient is receiving someone else's foreign immune system, um, that immune system may not recognize parts of the host body and turn and attack it. Uh, it sounds scary, but believe it or not, the concept itself is actually a good thing about allogeneic transplants. Because if the graft um, seeks out unknown tissues, that means it will also destroy cancer cells that may be remaining um, after transplant. Um, we call this the graft versus leukemic effect. And if it's present, um, it will help people stay in remission. However, often that graft attacks much more than just the leukemic cells. It can get out of control. That is what graft versus host disease is. We try, try to prevent this through HLA typing, like Lucas mentioned, and immunosuppression medication, um, but often it still occurs in some capacity. GVHD can manifest itself in two primary ways, uh, an acute form and a chronic form. This table shows some of the differences. Acute GVHD um, usually happens within the first three months after transplant, where chronic can happen within years after transplant. When treated, uh, acute graft-versus-host disease is shorter in duration, where chronic graft-versus-host disease can be longer in duration, sometimes lasting years. Acute graft-versus-host disease only manifests itself in the liver, skin, and uh, gastrointestinal tract, whereas the chronic form can affect many more organs or tissues such as skin, eyes, mouth, genitals, lungs, bowels, uh, liver, mu muscles, and joints. Both forms can uh, vary in intensity um, or severity with some being mild, some being quite severe. Both can be treated with systemic immunosuppression depending on the severity um, with mild forms only requiring sometimes uh, topical treatments and close monitoring. Nonetheless, it is very important that uh, either of these um, are caught early and uh, treated promptly. Next up is the uh, one to three time or one to three months after transplant. So this is where the patient is usually discharged from hospital, um, but they're still watched pretty closely. They can be usually managed with weekly clinic visits, um, getting their blood work once a week or multiple times per week, depending on how they're doing. It's important to note, like Lucas said, that most transplant centers require patients to stay somewhere close to this center itself, um, either if in a home, if they're fortunate enough to live close, um, or in a temporary living space. This is just to ensure that they'll have access to that specialized medical treat, uh, care that they need uh, if something were to go wrong. For example, uh, because I'm in Edmonton and uh, transplants are mostly done in Calgary, uh, our patients have to go live in Calgary for about um, three months after transplant. Some of the things that we watch for in this time, we're still watching for infections of various types. Um, I'm going to highlight two uh, viruses, uh, CMV and EBV, in the next slide. We're looking for acute graft versus host disease, um, but chronic graft versus host, host disease uh, might present itself as well during this time. Um, and then as well, we're watching the graft function, um, seeing how those counts are recovering. Um, at day about 100, we do another bone marrow biopsy. Um, this is to just look for any residual disease after transplant. So CMV and EBV. CMV um, stands for cytomegalovirus and EBV stands for Epstein-Barr virus. So these are very common in the general population. I already saw one of the questions mentioning um, if it was about 85%. I'm not sure about the exact number, um, but I wouldn't be surprised if that's correct. The thing is that both of these viruses are very common, but they usually don't cause too many issues in healthy individuals. They're more opportunistic in that they actually affect um, people who are immunocompromised more severely, um, like patients that have received allogeneic stem cell transplants. Um, so that's why we screen donors and patients um, just to know what we're working with and the risk for the patient afterwards. Um, but then afterwards we monitor patients' blood levels um, to see how much of that virus is there um, and if it's getting to a too high of a level in either the blood or a tissue, um, it can be dangerous. And that's why we uh, treat those instances with uh, medications to help bring those levels down. 
Um, ultimately, we hope that the immune system will recover to uh, enough of a point uh, to keep both of these viruses under control, which usually is about one year. Patients with blood disorders are probably pretty familiar with bone marrow biopsies um, as it's used to diagnose the blood disorder and it's used to monitor response to the treatment. Um, and just like any other treatment, uh, around day 100 or three months after transplant, we do a routine bone marrow biopsy um, to see how well it worked. Hopefully, this is the last bone marrow biopsy that a patient will need. Um, however, if counts fall or if there's suspicion for relapse uh, later in their journey, a bone marrow biopsy may be done at that time to rule out any disease. Next, we'll move on to the three to 12 months uh, follow-up range. At this point, as long as patients are doing well, they move to more of a see, be seen in clinic on a monthly basis rather than the weekly basis that they were having before. Um, here, we continue to monitor for infections of all sorts, um, focus more of our attention on chronic graft-versus-host disease as the acute form is less common after 100 days, um, and as well as uh, still watching that graft function. In this time, while we monitor for those things, uh, we also start to re-immunize patients and help them adjust to life after transplant. Why do we revaccinate our patients post-transplant? Well, um, when our patients have their immune systems wiped out, uh, the memory that is stored in that immune system is also wiped out. Um, so that's why some of that protection from prior vaccinations won't recover after transplant. That's why it's very important that patients receive um, those common vaccinations after transplant to train their body um, to protect themselves against uh, various infections. Timing after transplant does uh, matter. Uh, if a vaccine is given too early before your immune system can recover, it can be either ineffective or like uh, live vaccines, um, it can be actually dangerous. That is why patients usually are cleared for non-live vaccines, such as a flu shot around six months after transplant and live vaccines around two years, um, such as the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine. Uh, again, varies from site to site. What about COVID-19 vaccinations? Um, this is likely on everybody's, at uh, the top of everybody's mind, uh, just because of the, the year, couple of years that we've been having. Um, and because 2020 produced this new challenge for us, so we had to quickly figure out what this meant for our patients after transplant. Again, ver uh, recommendations vary from site to site. Um, however, the typical current 19 vaccines um, are usually given along with other non-live vaccines, which is usually around six months after transplant. <clears throat> Another thing that is uh, highlighted during months three to 12 is adjusting to life after transplant in a holistic way. This means focusing on the whole person, not just the physical components. Physical components are important too, and uh, those symptoms or concerns are investigated and addressed um, and look different from person to person. One example is fatigue. Um, we usually say that it takes about one year uh, to kind of return to pre-transplant levels. However, some people recover much quicker. Some people take a lot longer. Um, there are many different factors involved. Um, so it's important to be patient and to find ways to manage the, uh, the um, concern uh, while it's being figured out. Often physical concerns do recover to a somewhat pre-transplant state. However, in some cases, they actually become chronic. This is where it transforms into a person's new normal. Um, I've seen lots of my patients uh, um, transition into this new normal, um, having chronic conditions or chronic concerns after transplant. Um, they've always inspired me with their endurance, their courage, and their uh, creativity as they adjust um, to their new normal. Um, so it can definitely be done. Um, and it's pretty inspiring to see. Another area that will require after transplant is managing the mental and spiritual effects. I often remind my patients that after transplant, they've gone through a very difficult thing. Um, and it's very normal to feel many different emotions after transplant as they, um, they think more about it. At this time, they're often processing what has happened to them and wrestle with many existential questions. We encourage them to seek help from trained counselors and or pastoral care um, who can help them find the hope, meaning, purpose um, amidst their journey. Another area affected 
by transplant is actually sexual health. Fertility is usually diminished after transplant for men and women, and that's why it's encouraged um, for patients who are still hoping to have children um, to seek pre-transplant options. Uh, hormonal changes can happen to both sexes, uh, with women sometimes being put into a postmenopausal state with transplant. And uh, for a variety of physical, psychological, and social reasons, uh, sexual dysfunction can occur. Uh, that we encourage patients to be open to their healthcare team about these concerns um, because they may have some things that can help. In Edmonton, we have an awesome oncology sexual health clinic that has really helped many of my patients um, in this area. Last on the slide is social and financial health. Um, as both relationships and finances can be sometimes be stressed due to the many factors that transplant can bring. Social workers are usually available to assist patients and help them find uh, the resources available to them. Next, we move on to the one to two years after transplant. Here we start to relax a little bit more if everything is going well. Um, visits usually occur every three to six months and the team continues to monitor for issues such as chronic graft versus host disease um, and helping the patients adjust to their new normal. Some people even return to work or start returning to work in some capacity at this time. And then after two years, patients who are doing well transition into a more long-term follow-up portion of allo transplants. Due to the intense nature of transplants, um, patients still should be monitored or uh, diligent to continue to monitor for some of the long-term side effects of transplant. Um, this often looks like annual check-ins with a, either a transplant uh, physician, nurse practitioner, or even a family physician. Um, they're going to be watching for disease recurrence, um, and they're going to be also watching for uh, other types of cancers, um, thyroid issues, heart issues, kidney, bone issues, um, as well as altered hormone levels, uh, because all of these areas can be affected long-term uh, by transplant. Um, but that's why your team will be monitoring these things and uh, will be helping you to um, uh, prevent some issues and uh, treat them if they do occur. And then patients at this point um, just live with their new normal. Uh, some people have very minor issues um, while others deal with some sort of disability after transplant. It's really dependent on the circumstances and the person. Um, fortunately, I was able to work as a nurse on an inpatient hematology unit. And I've seen patients, I had the privilege of working with patients uh, when they were first diagnosed um, with uh, leukemia, for example. And uh, I watched them get their induction chemotherapy um, and then move on to transplant. And now I'm fortunate enough in my role to still follow up with some of those patients that I took care of before. And it's been very, um, it's, it's been a pleasure to kind of see them uh, living in their new normal. Um, I get to see them, some have gotten married, um, some tell me about the time that they spend with their grandchildren, some travel, some um, I do some pretty cool things with their work. Um, so I've been very, very privileged to see um, that for some patients. Yeah, so here again is the overview of um, an allogeneic stem cell transplant from a referral to follow-up. Um, we wanna say if you were a loved one uh, maybe considering an allo transplant. We realize that all this information could seem overwhelming and scary. Uh, we have seen allogeneic stem cell transplants prolong patients' lives um, significantly. Um, but like every medical intervention, there are risks involved and it might not be for everybody. So that's why it's very important to discuss with your hematologist who uh, would know you well and know your circumstances um, to get a better picture of whether it would be right for you or not. Yeah, we hope this provided a good overview. Um, we're really excited to be here and we're, um, and we hope that it was a, a good overview. We did want to highlight some resources if you want to read more about it um, or learn more about it. Like I just mentioned, your hematology team is the best um, because they'll know your specific circumstances as well as their educational material will be specific for their programs in each province um, because it does vary from province to province. Of course, the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society of Canada has great material, um, and as well the Canadian Cancer Society. Here are some of our uh, resources for pictures and information. Um, and uh, yeah, I believe we're gonna 
take some questions now. Perfect. Uh, thank you, Lucas and Jason, for sharing your expertise. Um, I think it's so important to build our information and knowledge around uh, allergenic stem cell transplants as we make uh, difficult decisions around medical care. So I'm going to get you to back up the slide one for me, Lucas. Oh, perfect. Thank you. So you're right in that it is now time for our question and answer period. Uh, it's been amazing to see all of the great questions coming in. Um, and so we may not get to all of the questions, but we will do our best afterwards to follow up with any questions we have received. Um, and if you haven't already done so and would still like to pop your question in the question box, uh, go to your Zoom webinar panel at the bottom and type in your question and we'll do our best to answer as many questions as possible. So the first question was for you, Lucas. Um, so you talked a little bit in your presentation around the donor um, and may have to give a boost at like a booster. Um, can you tell us a little bit more from a donor perspective what that might look like um, when they're requested for more stem cells? So it's definitely possible in um, use with related uh, donors and as well unrelated donors. Um, but kind of going back to the, um, the differences between the two is, you know, if it's a sibling or um, or it's even a haploidentical donor, which I didn't really talk about, is that's a half match donor. Uh, we are able to get them in for um, a second donation quite easily because we know where they are. Um, we can track them down and they're very good and reliable with uh, getting back in. Uh, which with the matched unrelated donors, um, there is a, just a bit more work in making sure that uh, that donor would able to again, be in uh, for a second collection. So, um, but it is very much possible. Excellent, thank you so much for answering that. We had a, another question here for cord blood. Um, are you able to grow the cells in a lab before transplant to have more cells? Is that possible? So cord ish, um, Cord donors, uh, we don't really heavily use them in Alberta at the moment, just because we do find um, uh, we're usually able to get by with a um, uh, to finding a donor. Um, now, I do believe that they are able to essentially expand the cells, um, but really the main issues with using those cord bloods um, is we're not able to reaccess them. And because of that variability in the initial uh, stem cell count, uh, they're not the greatest source um, that we can use now that we're improving um, our donor search capabilities and use of mismatched donors and monitoring and uh, accounting for some of the issues with using a mismatched donor. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Um, what is the HLA typing preferred matching? So a lot of people talk about like being a 10 out of 10 match or an eight out of eight. Can you tell us a little bit more about that preferred matching and those numbers? Yeah, so um, depending, it, it really is depending on um, the, uh, the, the site that is providing the donor search. So, um, Often you'll hear 10 out of 10 fully matched, um, but it's, it's really looking at the criteria that is involved with HLA typing. Um, there's generally five uh, parts of the DNA um, in that section that we're looking at. Um, now, some of the criteria are more important than others. Um, so it's really just depending on the center with what criteria they're looking for, but a full match is, um, a full match. So um, I think that's more important to, to uh, focus on, but definitely speak with your hematology team and transplant team um, about your donor HLA typing, because it, it, it does matter in the end. So, and they'll be able to provide you with the, the specifics with any mismatches. Excellent. Thank you for clarifying that for us. Um, and I know this is a question that we hear a lot uh, as well as, is there a maximum age for receiving an allergenic 
uh, bone marrow transplant? I know it's something we hear. Um, so I'd love for you to maybe talk a little bit about um, determining that and if it is a hard line for NH. So definitely a very common question. Um, there is not a cutoff age. Um, but with that being said, once patients are kind of 70 and up, we don't necessarily get too excited about the prospect of transplant, just because we know with increased age, we have higher um, incidence of um, organ dysfunction and um, comorbidities. So we want to make sure that the patient going into transplant um, will not have severe complications uh, post-transplant and will be able to get through the transplant. We're trying to give people many more years. Um, so if we don't think that we can do that with transplant, then I don't think it's something that would be offered or pursued. Um, but that being said, you know, um, a 67-year-old uh, might not be in the greatest shape of their life and a 72 year old might be in much better um, shape. So we're looking at it case by case, but we try not to take age as a, um, like a eligibility criteria right off the bat. Mm -hmm. Excellent, thank you for clarifying that. Um, so we are going to have our last question now. Um, so the very last question is today we have uh, people with us who are from Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta and British Columbia. And I know provinces do things a little bit differently, but in generally, um, you know, how, how are things being done? Are they being done similar in terms of like the intake process and the whole kind of moving a patient from, you know, uh, beginning to uh, admitting through to bone marrow transplant. So is that process similar in all of the different provinces? The general themes of um, getting to transplant are all going to be very similar. Um, HLA typing is all going to be very standardized. Um, all transplant uh, programs in Canada that were all, um, you know, accredited under the same um, uh, I guess, monitoring um, procedures. Uh, so we have uh, CIBMTR, um, we have fact accreditation. So everything is very much regulated. Um, there'll just be different nuances in the workup process for each program. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, I just really want to express our gratitude to you, Lucas and Jason, for taking the time out of your super busy schedules to be here today and to share your experience and knowledge in working with bone marrow transplant recipients and in both treatment and recovery. So thank you for supporting our community today and being here with us. Next slide, please, Lucas. This webcast was made possible uh, thanks to the support of Estella. Next slide. I'd like to remind everyone that we are here to help you. Do not hesitate to contact the LLSC if you need more information or support. You can reach us by email at info at or toll free at one 222 4884 also make sure to check out our website regularly as all and past uh, webcasts will be found there. So you can find this webcast as well as upcoming webcasts on our website. Please note that we will send you a short survey afterwards. Uh, we'd greatly appreciate you taking a few moments to fill it in as it will help us to determine future topics and valuable information that's important to you. Uh, and the last thing just to mention is if you haven't already registered for session three today and would like to attend, please contact Desiree. Uh, it's desiree.nailer at lls.org. She posted in the chat box earlier, so you can find her email link there. The next session is at 2.30 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. And the topic is on life after acute myeloid leukemia, personal stories of hope. So we hope you enjoyed our session today. Thank you all for joining us and have a wonderful day and stay safe.